Welcome to the Ignited Recovery Podcast, a new way forward for anyone looking for answers but feeling left out. If you've been searching for empowerment, triumph, and purpose, you've found them right here. You won't hear the same solutions and you're not going to have any excuses to fall back on because Ignited Recovery allows heroes to rise and become their best selves. I'm Dr. Adi Jaffe and I can't wait to be your guide on this journey. Are you ready to become an Ignited Hero? What happens sometimes when you get people from your past life who kind of not only want to reconnect, but they want to reconnect and they see you as the person that you used to be. And so, um, you know, they kind of, they talk to you as if, yeah, yeah, you're trying all this hoity-toity shit, but I know who you are for real. Like, get back on the bus and let's do this. Like, you know how to do. Um, and the conflict that can happen, right? I mean, you have to be really, really strong in yourself. Like, really solid in who you are. Um, A, to avoid the pull. But also to say to somebody, because you've never practiced it with them ever in your life before, to say to somebody, hey, you know what? Um, I'm sorry you don't understand it and you don't see where I'm going, but this is, this is where I'm at now. I understand you saw me in a different way before, but like, this is where I'm at now and this is my place. When somebody comes in and they say, the fuck are you doing? A, you're doing a podcast and you're improving your life and you're, you're pretending like you're better. Uh, I know... I know you're really just a uh, blah, blah, you know, whatever, fill in your, fill in whatever fits into your life. And, um, and it's really easy sometimes to fall back into that place. Do you get reunited with somebody like that who might be toxic? Um, because maybe they appreciate you, but, and love you maybe even, but they love you for that person. Um, or, do, you know, do you, how do you respond to them? And I think that's, it's a really interesting question that is quote unquote easy for me to talk about now because I'm 19 years after that shit was really happening to me. But it's not that easy initially. Like I'll tell you guys from two to three months into my recovery, like I changed my phone number because so many people from my past, and I used to be their drug dealer, they would just call me constantly and like, and try to reconnect. And I didn't even think about it. And I remember being really resistant when my dad and I think my I don't remember who it was, a friend or somebody at the rehab. I don't remember who it was, but somebody else were like, hey, you should get a new number. Um, because all those people were kind of coming back and it, it feels almost like somebody trying to pull you, right? It's almost somebody like holding onto your leg and you're just trying to get away. You're like, come on, oh, just let me go. But every time they pull, just like a physical pull, there's a little piece of you that kind of just jolts back. You know, we've talked before about exercising and like building up your physical strength, but you have to build up mental strength to be able to go do it. And I'll tell you, it's really nice to be able to go back once you're, you're solid, you're standing on your own two feet and be able to start sifting through those relationships and kind of figure out, okay, well that guy might go out and then and party on the weekends. I don't want to join that part of his world, but maybe I can go have dinner with him and still connect as a friend and, and be in my kind of in, in my truth. But it takes time, right? It takes time to feel that strong. Um, I was just at this conference and I found these amazing cards and they're like, it's a sort of inner game on figuring out where my boundaries are great and where they're lacking. Here's the thing that so many people miss you build mental strength actually the same way you build physical strength, right? So here's the thing. I, um, you know, we have the garage right behind me over here. I was working from the garage for two and a half years, but now I'm actually inside the house. Uh, I've been promoted. And, um, and so now we actually have a garage because we didn't really have the garage before with my office and some storage. So I'm going to build a little workout area in there. Well, how do you work out? The way you work out, it's funny. I was actually just explaining this to my seven-year-old earlier today. The way you work out is um, you put on some weight. You put on a bar or you, uh, you take 
big chunks of metal that are a certain weight or like I bought a weighted vest, which is you can put it on your body and it's got like 20, 30, 40 pounds. You can adjust how many, how many little like bags of, of heavy sand you put in it, but you take on more weight than you normally do. And then you push it or you pull it or you do things with that weight and it's hard, right? It's harder than it would be to normally do that thing. So today with the vest, for instance, I put on a vest, so I, I've got 30 more pounds on me and we had this, um, this step. And so he and I step alternatively, like he was stepping from one direction and I'm stepping from the other. But when I'm stepping, so first of all, that's hard by itself because you're making your legs push you, you up and we do that to some extent, but we don't do it as much. Uh, but now I've got 30 more pounds on me. So my body, when I climb stairs, or when I walk, it doesn't have to lift 185 pounds. It has to lift 155 pounds. So now I'm stepping up and down on this step for minutes and my body has to live up to that resistance. It has to increase its ability to work through that resistance. And because it's not used to it, it strains you and it, it causes you to sweat and it warms you up and your body has to work extra hard and it brings more blood to those muscles and it makes those muscles collect more oxygen and then more protein and it builds up those muscles. You, you try to push yourself to the edge of your ability, not so far that you get injured, but far enough that your body is spent and then it puts all its resources into fixing or repairing that part of the body you just worked out. So the hope is after I did that workout and I did squats as well during that thing to really work the legs out, the hope is that my body is just working really, really hard to fix the legs. My legs are going to hurt today. They're going to hurt tomorrow. They're going to hurt the day after, but they're gradually going to repair themselves and they're going to come out stronger three, four, five days from now than they were today. Now we understand this physically. We all understand it. How do you get better at running? You run more, right? You can't get better at running by talking about it. I just talked about working out for five minutes here. My body is not getting any stronger because I just talked about working out for five minutes. But with mental health, we somehow assume that we can just want it to get better or we can sit around and, and talk about how we hope that it will be better. But what makes it better is the exercise. What makes it better is literally, what makes it better is acknowledging the areas that we're weaker in than we'd like to be and then exercising them. Not run away from them, not pretend like they don't exist, not talk about them, go and work them out. So, you know, when somebody says I'm struggling with depression, my question is about what, right? Like, what is it? Because people talk, people say anxiety a lot and they say depression a lot, but anxiety typically are repetitive pseudo obsessive thoughts in our heads about things we don't like about ourselves, about our surroundings, about people, about things we've done, things we, we think we won't do, right? There, there are all these specific things we can be anxious about. I think it's really important to understand, well, what are you anxious about? What is it causing you anxiety? And the same with depression, the same with all these things. Instead of doing what a lot of other people will do, which is, I shouldn't be triggered right now, I'll pretend I'm not triggered, and then the trigger will go away, you did the opposite. You said, hey, I don't know why, but I'm really triggered, creating awareness of where you feel weak emotionally and psychologically. First, we identified it. And then we got to have a conversation about it. That conversation was some exercise around it. Because instead of running away from the trigger, which is, let's be honest, what we mostly do, right? Something is uncomfortable. What do we do when something is uncomfortable for the most part? What do we all typically do when something is uncomfortable? Avoid it like the fucking plague. Hey, I don't like that person. Just not going to talk to them anymore. That friend of mine did something that really pisses me off. I'm not going to mention it. Not going to talk to them until it goes away and I don't care about it anymore. And then we'll talk again. Right? That's what we do all the time. It doesn't solve any problem, but that's what we do all the time. Steve, you brought it up. So then we were able to talk about it. Not only were you exercising your ability to say, I'm feeling strange right now and learn that that's okay. But also we got, we found a different solution. You thought there was something about you that made you triggered because we mentioned drinking and all that. And we realized that that wasn't it at all. 
what brought what came up was a conversation you used to have when you lived a very stressful life and your body was reacting to it the way it always had. And in that moment, I remember, I think when you talked about it, just recognizing what it was that was really causing the trigger made you less triggered because the anxiety about why the hell am I triggered went away a little bit. And then we went one level beyond and you did it and you shot the video. I don't know. I know, again, Dumont, you didn't see this, but Steve showed us a video on uh, Facebook of him doing this exercise. We had to, I made him pour alcohol out. For all my clients that I've worked with over the years, this is one of those insane exercises. They're like, what the fuck? What are you talking about? That makes no sense because we've never done it. We've never poured out alcohol. We never smelled alcohol in a glass and then said, bye, see you later. And then we wonder why we can't leave a glass of wine empty on the, on the table. And we tell ourselves there's something wrong with me. I'm the guy who's always cleaning up everybody's glasses. There's nothing wrong with you. I can train the exact opposite thing in you. You just have to do it. You have to train it. So Omaira, when you were asking, how do we do it? We train it. And Steve did it, right? He literally like poured a glass of wine and then poured it out. Um, did it cause you a lot of pain, Steve? Were you walking around for days later kind of saying to yourself, shit, I lost that glass. Now I really want to drink it again. Did you like go after the sink and try to drink the glass of wine in the sink? <laughs> um, no, it didn't cause me any pain whatsoever. No pain, right? I, um, haven't, poured, I haven't poured another one away since then. I should sure. do that. <laughs> well, now you know it's possible. Yes. Now you know it's possible and it's opened up a different way of, of relating to alcohol. Um, I'll tell you, the number of times, this never used to happen in my life, but the number of times my wife and I will open up a bottle of wine, pour like a glass for each of us, have half of it, three quarters, she'll leave some, I'll leave some, or both of us will. And then at the end of the night or the next morning, we wake up, we're like, oh shit, we left some wine and we pour it out. The number of times it's happened now is in the hundreds. But all it took was that first time to realize that I can. The first thing that we can do if we don't feel strong enough to actually physically uh, kind of exercise our, our mind in this way is to do it through our imagination. I didn't make this shit up. I actually borrowed it fully from phobia work. Um, so about 10, 15 years ago, I was, I had a lot of friends who studied phobias and this is how you treat people with phobias is, you gradually walk them from, I can't even talk about this thing. Every time I get near it, I lose my shit and I can't control myself, which when I was in graduate school sounded a lot like I can't control this drink. Every time I get near it, it takes control over me and I lose my mind, right? That's the way we learn about alcohol and alcoholism. I talk about it today in, in the workshop. And, um, and so what they do is a gradual introduction, virtual initially, only in their heads or through videos and watching stuff. And then very gradually towards actual exposure to the thing that people are scared of. What do we want the, what do we want life to look like five years from now? And by the way, if some of those social media channels and some of these other things you just don't want in anymore, you can just write them off. It's not, there's nothing particularly you have to let in, but have the conversation and say, okay, well, if I want to be able to do that thing, just like we've talked about before with your weightlifting, if I want to be able to do that, I've got to exercise towards it. When somebody tells me that I can't have something, it's all I can think about. It's all I want. By the way, one of the main reasons why I tell people, like, if, you, if you're not ready to quit, stop trying to quit. Because <laughs> then all you're doing when you're quitting is you're sitting around thinking about the thing you don't get to do. And then eventually when you relapse, you're going to tell yourself, you see, fuck it. I knew it. I couldn't ever do it because I tried my hardest. But all you were trying to do your hardest is stop yourself from doing the thing you don't want to stop anyway. So... And part of what we're dealing with right now is where you are right now. Where is this origin point, right? Um, I think I say it in the, in the course in this way, but like if I'm in LA and I want to get to San Francisco, I need to know those two things to map out the road in between. Because getting to San Francisco is not enough. You just told me where you're trying to get. But if I don't know where I'm starting, it's hard to, to do that. So we can get into the specifics here in a moment. But you said when I am told I can't do something. So there was a study done, this is in the 70s, it's not new, but there was a study done in the 70s in Florida looking at, um, so the, a law got passed and, and the law had to do with um, laundry detergents in this one county with a laundry detergent, a set of laundry detergents that had um, like some phosphate, it's like sulfite, phosphate, I don't remember exactly the chemical, but it was like 
a cleaning chemical that was proven to be really bad for the environment. Um, in Florida, they have the Everglades, they have all this natural life. And so like in California, they're really pretty aware of their um, you know, conservation um, elements and how the, that relates to their environment. So in this one county, they outlawed this type of detergent. And these researchers went and they studied that county and another county and looked at how people rated and liked different laundry detergents. Now, before this law passed, because it was time to implement, so like the law passed, but just like normally, you know, a law passed and there's like three, four, five months later or a year later that it actually goes into effect so everybody can adjust. So during that time, they got a measurement. And at that time, everybody's rating of all the different, um, you know, they rated different kind of detergents and there were no di big differences between the two counties. Then they went back a while after they had to take all of these phosphate detergents off the shelf in that one county. And what they found was only in that county, people started rating phosphate detergents as better than before and better than the ones that they had available. And they found that some people were leaving that county and going to another county to buy those detergents that were no longer available to them. Now, the idea in the study is we don't like having our freedoms restricted. When somebody takes away things that we can do, even if we didn't really want them in the first place, we now want them more because we can't have them. Now, I think if I'm right, it makes rational sense, right? Like, have you found yourself in a situation like that where you want the things you can't have? Like if somebody tells you, hey, can't have gluten anymore, it's not good for you, like all you see is bread everywhere. Like just all of a sudden you're like, fuck, everything has bread in it, I can't eat anything, right? Um, not, a big, not as big a deal before, a bigger deal once it's been restricted. So you're right, and it's, again, part of the reason why I don't do that to people, because me telling you you can or can't drink doesn't do anything to your actual drinking. It just does something to your desire to drink. And I don't need to make this harder for any of you. Thank you for tuning in to the Ignited Heroes Recovery Podcast. I really hope you found the information here useful and that we'll see you back here next week. And look, I want to make sure that this podcast is the most useful it can be for you. So please let me know by emailing info at ignited.com if there are any specific topics or questions you'd like to have addressed. As usual, if you like this episode, I would love for you to leave us a five-star review and rating. Thanks and see you next week.